about the bad place. The other bad place is just in with the highest colour of the pink one. You were wrong. Here in this machinery, I have gone beyond that. I have discovered the great ray that first brought light into the world. Oh, and your proof? Tonight you shall have your proof. At first I experimented only with dead animals, and then a human heart which I kept beating for three weeks. But now I am going to turn that ray on that body and endow it with life. And you really believe that you can bring life to the dead? That body is not dead. It has never lived. Hello everyone, I see you have started the test. I know, just to say welcome to uh, the Imaginarium and the Festival of Imagination. I'm delighted to welcome Johnny, director, director of CIFAR, Professor Johnny Building, who is going to talk to us today about uh, the Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate you being here. Um, I first wanted to give my <coughs> heartfelt thanks to Beth Dibbershire. She's a fantastic artist. She's an artist at the Center for Fine Art Research, CIFAR, and um, she's, this is her mad brain you're inside of. Um, and it's wonderful to be inside that brain. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank Selfridges and uh, being brave. I think that uh, you don't usually see this kind of uh, situation where uh, intellectuals and artists and, and the curious are able to mingle within uh, what normally goes under a thing called consumerism. So it's, kind of, it's just wonderful. I just want to thank uh, the whole team at Selfridges for thinking outside the box, or maybe thinking inside the box. Anyway, <laughs> thinking somehow in the box. Um, anyway, okay, so my title of the talk is called Urban Alchemy. Can you go, guys hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. It's called Urban Alchemy. Hello. And what the clip you just heard was from um, the 1931 film Frankenstein. And I'm just going to show, I'm just going to play the rest of it because it's kind of, I wanted to introduce you to some of this. But I want you to see what Mary Shelley, who invented Frankenstein, how they understood. The I learned a great life. deal from you at the university oh, no, no, about the wrong. violet ray. Wrong, wrong. The ultraviolet ray, which you said was the highest color in the spectrum. Sorry. <laughs> you were wrong. Here in this machinery, I have gone beyond that. I have discovered the great ray that first brought light into the world. Oh, and your proof? Tonight you shall have your proof. First I experimented only with dead animals, and then a human heart, which I kept beating for three weeks. We're just going to keep seeing this clip over and again. now, <laughs> yeah, this place is I'm going to turn that ray on that body and endow it with life. And you really believe that you can bring life to the dead? That body is not dead. It has never lived. Okay, that's what, that body I is not dead. dead. I, I made it with my own hands from the bodies I took from graves, from the gallows, anywhere. Go and see for yourself. He sees a dead hand.
of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was the name in Western uh, worlds because the, world, the word enlightenment under Buddhism is something very different. So in the Western world, in the 17, late 1700s, in Germany, people were asked, how do you name the time period we're in? How do you name it? Like, what do you name the time period we're in now? What would you name it? And I had a contest in the newspapers in the late 1700s, the 1794, somewhere in there. And many people responded. One of the persons who responded was Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, who was a German philosopher who apparently never went out of his visit except on a very regular basis to make walks to the butcher and back again. And he decided to call it, he named it, the Enlightenment. And what he meant by that was the ability to think and the ability to realize that everyone had a brain in their head. And that brain was something that would allow people to do a thing that he called exit. Now this exiting, this is by the artist Grace Williams, uh, who it's, um, I'll get the name of it in a minute, I've had it written. Oh no, it's from uh, Escamontage, I'm saying that wrong, it's the French tradition of the vanishing woman. The question of the Enlightenment was twofold. One was dare to know. Superiaude, dare to know. What were you supposed to dare to know? Dare to be curious enough to say, if it could be different, what would your different look like? If you could think, supposing it could be otherwise, what would your otherwise look like? You see, for so long, people relied on their priest or their teachers or their rabbis to tell them what the otherwise would look like. But under this new weird world of technology and steam engines and what later on would become uh, different forms of alchemic uh, reactions, there was the thinking, wow, it really might be otherwise. It really could look differently. And what would that look like? So the first question that Kant poses is to ask you the question, Supposing it could be otherwise, what would your otherwise look like? Think about it. Gosh, you know, other people are thinking about it, so what would you come up with? What would you actually come up with? First question. But the second question, tied to that question, was how would you know how to get out of the present experience if your experience was locking you in? was making you something you didn't want to be, was causing you a problem of how to be fully who you are, or who you might want to be, or who you might want to become. Later on, we find out that people like Foucault will call that a stylistics of existence. How do you style yourself? How do you, there's many things you could go outside of this uh, lovely brain of Beth and go and see how to stall yourself. Well, how would you do it? How would you actually figure out what you are and what you want to become? And then a bigger question, what is our society and what should our society become? Now, see, these are very big questions. I'm sorry to put it on your plate right now, uh, but there you go. You need to think about what is it that we could become. The very fact that I can raise that question to you and you think, hmm, I don't know, what could we become, put you as a modern. People who think that they can actually change the reality, that it's not unfolding as some kind of seed that becomes a tree, the famous acorn unfolding to become a tree, that it can become something else. I always say to my students, it could become a Maserati car. What would happen if you could really change everything? And like in the Boris Karloff clip of Frankenstein, what would that mean to invent life? We can start with inventing your own life. That at least you have some kind of relationship to. But what would it mean to invent life? For you to invent life. So I'm going to let that hover. And I'm going to give you what Mary Shelley thought was the answer. She said to herself, and out loud, 
I busied myself to think of a story which would speak to the mysteries of fear of our nature and awaken thrilling horror. One to make the reader dread to look around, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. And so I began my story of how do I become who I am. So it's a very interesting thing. First of all, it's lovely that Mary Shelley is thinking this way as, as herself, as the Frankenstein. But when you think about breaking the bonds of various things, racism, sexism, homophobia, all the other isms that we seem to deal with, uh, you know, even the smaller ones, like, I don't know, you just can't get out somehow. How do you break that? How do you change it? What are you trying to change into? So these were the kind of things that became the basis in the 1790s of what it would be to make our society. Now, you know, there's a lot of trouble with this because in the intervening years of becoming modern, often, if you didn't make anything of yourself, you would be blamed for that. So the, the sad side of that wonderful, exciting energy was that if you couldn't make something of yourself, then it's your fault. So that was the next problem. The next problem was how do you deal with the fact that on the one side, you can make something of yourself, and on the other side, the terror side, oh, wow, I have to make something of myself. You see, it's very complicated. So various people throughout the ages, throughout the ages since the 1700s, have asked this question, how do we do it? And I want to bring in one of the answers, which you've probably already seen before, Dolly. Have you heard of Dolly, Dolly Sheep? Dolly is the name of the larger sheep, and Dolly is also the name of the baby sheep. In 2010, at an institute called the Ventier Institute, they took a single cell, one cell, in a test tube, and from that created life. Now that's creepy. Now the life that they created was not a life quite like the dolly that you see there. The life they created in 2010 was amoebic. But these days, we're now having things like robots. And by robots, in case you want to sound like you really know what's going on at dinner parties, you want to say bot, not robot. OK, helpful clue here. Bots are, could be anything from these plastic, uh, you know, I don't know, things that you have on a wall which would be able to figure out what you would want before maybe even you knew what you wanted. Creepy. I mean, the good news is that you might want to do other things. The bad news is that somebody or something is thinking for you. And that something or someone that's thinking for you may in fact become you. What would happen if you went to a party and somebody was exactly you at the party, if there was a clone of yourself. So here we have Dolly, and Dolly, little Dolly. It's not that the little Dolly is just the daughter of Dolly. The little Dolly is Dolly. The little Dolly is the exact replica, point for point, cell for cell, of the Dolly. So I just want to read you this little bit of uh, what happened with Cynthia, because Cynthia was the name of the single-celled organism. And I put it like this. On May 20th, 2010, an announcement by the J. Craig Venter Institute in Rockville, Maryland, heralded the generative birth of the first man-made single-cell organism, which they called Cynthia with an S, like Cynthia, because you didn't miss that. Cynthia with an S. Cynthia with an S had been sequenced from the genetic code of the mycoplasma genitalium, probably too much information, the world's smallest living bacteria found primarily in cattle and goats. Now, global reports flooded all over the web and all over communication technologies and different uh, social platforms, describing in lurid detail how this natural DNA, this thing called a natural DNA of the mycoplasma genitalium, 
was stripped out from its cell, copied point for point, resequenced, imprinted with a watermark, uploaded into its original, or what they called a bio original, bio dash original, as an artificial, that is to say, synthetic form of life. It was considered a life form because this new artificial cell, now and without any of its natural biomatter, begin began to replicate biologically. Biologically. Bio dash logically. And while it is true that this replication and what it produced might not be seen quite at the same level as when we saw earlier on Dr. Frankenstein's monster's finger trembled as a sign of life on his laboratory table, this replication has held and still holds all the same terrors, all the same jubilations, and all the same ethical conundrums and promises of that 19th century shout, it's alive. It's alive. In the beginning, you see, there was the word. And that word was Cynthia. And for you to grasp how powerful that is, maybe you're beginning to feel it now, maybe that chill, that chill of realization of how the alchemic moment actually forms the basis of knowledge becomes a little clearer in your mind. So that moves us into, which I couldn't find a photo for, sorry about this, the problem of complexity. Now I'm not going to, you know, I realize that I'm combining about 10 years of uh, various forms of philosophic and mathematical and physics questions, so sorry. So we're just going to talk about a little tiny thing. In the enlightenment of the, of the Kant and the asking the questions about industrialization and how you could actually think the world could change, maybe there's God, maybe there's not a God, but whether or not there's a God, people can make the world change. It became very political. So you might be born as an acorn. You might know that to, to make this acorn grow and flourish, you need water, you need soil, and you know that if you did it right, figured out how to do it right, you would have a tree. You would never have a Maserati car. And that works perfectly well if you only want to have trees out of an acorn. But let's say you're born a slave, and in that logic, you would grow up to be a big slave. In that logic, you're born in a certain way, and you grow up to be exactly what you were predestined to become. So you see, the Enlightenment shattered that. It brought a horror and a thrill and a, wow, to the table. Now, today I mention the word complexity because what allowed one to start thinking about that kind of Frankenstein that we just saw and the way in which this notion of alive starts to play itself out today has a total, not a totally different, but a, let's say relatively different understanding to it. That difference is understood as a word called complexity, by which they don't mean it's complicated. Complexity means that when you add things together, you can think in an imaginative way that creates a reality that isn't something you can actually touch, but it still exists. Now that sounds very convoluted, doesn't it? But you're used to it. You're used to it because everybody or many people have an iPhone. You're pretty probably used to what an iPhone looks like or an iPod. An iPod has 5,000 records in it, 10,000 songs, but if you broke open that thing, would you find them? No. So the material that's inside your iPod, or the material that's inside your brain, can be understood in a different way than what would have been understood in the Enlightenment time period of the 1700s. This new Enlightenment deals with a different kind of alchemy, a different kind of way in which you pull things, pull elements together elements that really don't have, I don't know, um, a, a, a place to pin something down, elements that kind of float. How would you grab what's inside your computer? How would you know how to, how to move it? How would you save it or not? So these are the things that are very, very different. Now, I want to call that magic, but I'm not the only one who calls it magic because there's a, there's a person who you might have heard of, uh, maybe not, called Arthur Clarke. 
Martha Clark talks about technology and magic in the same way that I'm trying to present here. And he refers to this thing called the third law of technology. And the third law of technology for him states that anything that is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's kind of interesting too. We're going to take this word magic, we're going to take this word alchemy. The reasons I like it is because magic implies the horror, implies the scare, but it's also kind of fun. It's also kind of playful. And in its playfulness, one begins to learn how to invent. It's something that you're not necessarily born with, how to be creative. Sometimes you've got to learn how to be creative. And that, that starts with breaking outside the box. Now, I have a name for this that uh, there's a number of my students here tonight, which I appreciate them being here, um, from my MA and PhD and postdoc uh, environments at CIFAR. So they've heard variations on what I'm saying today. But I would call this material thing that we're talking about, this kind of thing that you can hold but you can't hold, you can walk on but you can't walk on, you know exists because it's in your computer, it's a file, but if the computer died or broke, you wouldn't be able to grab your file out of it. This I call ANA, A-N-A, dash material. This is a very different kind of materialism. And I think that that name, that ANA material, that ANA materialism, names what I call a kind of reckoning. A, I, maybe that's too, too American, this notion of reckoning. I'm not sure if people know what that word means in the American term, but reckoning means that you think something. You, you sit there and you think, yeah, that makes sense. There's a reckoning. There's, but you're also called to account. So reckoning has a kind of way of witnessing through being driven by your gut. You're, you're thinking it through. It, it, we're on a kind of reckoning right now. We're on this moment, what I call caught in mid-run. Just like asking the question with Kant, how would you name our time period? How would you deal with the stylistics of existence as they are now? And I think that what happens in this context is that time becomes timing, and space becomes spacings, and existence becomes a style of existence. These are not just words that just you know, float around. They have real um, substance to what is going on in our world. And I think that at the end of the day, or in the middle of it, you have people like um, Deleuze and Guattari, who I'm sure you've heard about or some of you have heard about, uh, who start talking about how one begins to create this animaterial. And for Deleuze and Guattari, as well as a, a number of people here, you have to think about how this repeat, this, this ability to clone, this ability to have the what's called iterability, the, the way in which something can be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, and in that repeat, something different happens. That's weird. So if I go one, 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 we know that I'm saying one. But maybe in the way you're hearing it, in the spacings, in the repetition of that one, a something else is born, a something new, a something different, a something other. Now, I like to call it, because I'm a philosopher and I tend to name things like philosophers do, but I like to give them nicknames. I like to call that not a fragment of life, but a fractal of life, a slice of life, a slice that just comes through it. But Deleuze and Guattari and other people call it simply the task of art. As artists, that's what you do. You take the alchemic moment and you make it breathe. You make it come alive. You make it exit. You make it work. I mean, that's not to say everything you do or write or say is perfect and fabulous and works. But it's got that moment of change embedded in it. And for that, I want to say it's a kind of delicate game. It's a delicate game that we end up playing in this time period, in the 21st century time period, because the synthetic Cynthias that are coming to be, the bots that are coming into our homes, the way in which it's not just uh, the Google that is uh, you know, following our every move with our little iPhones and so on. This is a game that is not for fools and horses, or anyway, maybe not just for fools and horses. 
It's a game that requires curiosity, romanticism, and the willingness to have fun, to not forget about fun in the middle of all the horror and the trauma and everything else that's going on. Because as I will leave you with this last phrase, as a very wise uh, intellectual, one of my teachers, uh, someone I cared about very much, used to say, this is Michel Foucault, he used to say, the things we fight against are abominable, but that doesn't mean that you can't, that you must be miserable in fighting them. You must learn to take the fun and make it alchemically enter into your picture of the task of art and therefore the task of what is to become the now. And for that, I thank all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we have one last thing to show you because this is how I wanted to end this. The end is very important. This is by an artist uh, oops, named uh, Sophie Hedrick. Uh, it's called Swift as a Shadow. And I think this is a very beautiful swirling comment about this form of invention and play. Or not. I don't think so bad. about with the Enlightenment and thinking about sort of perhaps we, we could talk a little bit or introduce some people who might not be familiar in the audience to the idea of the arcades, the arcades project and, ha and, and perhaps if we can think about where we are right now sitting at the heart of yes. suffrages which is in, a, in the bull ring which is effectively an arcade and thinking about that hinge between the Enlightenment and those sorts of discoveries and curiosity about creating our own stylistics, as you talked about, and how, I mean, I'm just thinking, is there a way that we can explore that in relation to sitting in a retail yeah. store and having a, a lecture, <laughs> effectively, or, or a, a discussion about the Enlightenment? Why didn't, you know. uh, so this is how I would see it. And you might want to wonder, why was this called um, urban alchemy and not, I don't know, just some other form of alchemy? The reason I called it urban is because I do believe that the kind of way in which these inventions happen can only happen when you have an urban motif going on. Now that is going to raise hopefully some questions in your minds, but in the 1930s in particular, there was a, a flourishing of arcades. Now if you walk around uh, Birmingham, you're going to see quite a lot of arcades. You know, you might see them as just running from point A to B, but this was a very specific way in which uh, the notion of being alive and inventing who you are included this kind of connections between the outside world, the inside world, and so on. And, and they're very beautiful. And Walter Benjamin was one of the people that wrote quite a lot about there. In fact, he has a book called The Arcades, which is these sort of snapshots. So if you go buy or go look at the book, don't think you're going to read a story. It's got lots of little snippets in it. And in this, the arcades allowed for industry and business and, and, and shopping, basically, from everything from clothes to, you know, uh, technologies of any kind at that point. It allowed people to imagine. You look into a store window. You go through on your, day, on your daily moment, going to, from point A to B, you go through these arcades and you could imagine. And what would you imagine? You see, it's a very different notion of public that's going on there. That that's not happening these days. In fact, there's, a, there's an attempt to wipe out arcades. There's an attempt to have everything behind 
and up high so that you know the masses or the middle classes or anyway the people who walk on the streets in fact the streets in the cities don't get to have that kind of imagination don't get to walk through those kind of beautiful tunnels the tunnels that have lights and and little dancing you know children thinking about the uh, window displays on Fifth Avenue in New York which is where I'm from and as a child we used to go we, as a child I used to go with my uh, folks to look at the beauty to just see what these storefront windows would do the whole idea of passing through something at floor level or in a way when it's just coming to it sideways so you didn't have to be studying it like you know with small eyes and thinking oh yeah I got a grill and how's that gonna work no instead just kind of goes by you. It's how you're shopping. There was a name for it, dandyism. You could be a dandy. You could walk through this area, these kind of arcades, and begin to fashion who you are. You can do it these days. You don't have to literally walk through an arcade these days to do this, but you can walk around and see someone's haircut, for example, or see someone who's wearing some interesting shoes. You think, yeah, I like that. I think I'll borrow that. I think I'll take that. I think I'll wear it. So the arcades had a very specific way of linking industry, business, department stores mainly, and people who could just sort of wander through, who might not have any money, they just wander through to see. And then they could take that and start to invent. And this became the lifeblood of a lot of different places. Paris, as it turns out, Birmingham. I mean, I was shocked when I came here because there are quite a lot of arcades in this town. And it's a perfect place to do a project on arcades. In fact, there was a, um, a, a person who spoke at the Imaginarium not that long ago, Luke, um, I forgot his last name actually, Hegel. and he was uh, talking about how the arcades exist even without having uh, covers on them in Birmingham. So anything that's like an alleyway that allows you to walk through and imagine. So anytime you're walking through something and it allows you to, it sparks your imagination, you're in an arcade. And so what's very interting about that is that this is where I think selfish is kind of interesting, what they're trying to do with this uh, notion, is that you start playing in a very gentle way, not in this kind of you will learn and then I'm going to grade you and you're doing that, but this gentle way of thinking about how can you grow your imagination. And when you do that, and not just as me, 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 I, 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 but as a great big us, a great big we. How do we do this in a way that takes everybody with us? And it doesn't have to be a homogeneous version. Doesn't that is say it doesn't have to be exactly the same for everybody. That was what was so peculiar about the repetition notion that I was trying to talk about. That repetition, while it might be point for point the same thing, that was something different was being established. You know that those two dollies, the dolly sheep big and the dolly sheep little, while exactly are the same, probably don't, I would think, don't literally think the same. Don't really, certainly they don't eat the same. They don't go to the bathroom the same. They're two different bodies. So it's very interesting how you can have repetition, go every day to work, come every day back, go every day to work, come every day back, and you're going through an arcade. It's eye candy. And that word candy, very important. So this was, this was not just something that popped out of the air. This was something that, that town planners thought about. How can we make it so that people have their eye candy? They didn't use the word eye candy, that came later. But this was the way in which one could begin to think this through. So thanks, Beth, for raising that as a question. Because I think that I, I left that little segment out. Uh, and I just think that it's a very important way to start understanding how, at the everyday level, you can break outside the box. Even in your, your routine, you can get the eye candy. You can look around even within the box. In this room, there's a lot of eye candy. I don't know if you notice the things hanging on the, uh, from the, um, the little light bulb, uh, um, I don't know what to call this, in uh, They're fantastic because they let you think, well, what are, what are they doing there? What are they, why are they there? You know, what, what put them there? Supposing they have something else there. Okay. And you start allowing yourself to break those bounds that are holding you. And that's part of the questions, and that's part of what this enlightenment question is all about. It's scary. It's fabulous. It's boring sometimes. And sometimes it's really horrible. And you need to 
step up to the plate and allow yourself the right to be boring and horrible and fun and interesting. And that's basically what this arcade allows one or tried to allow one and still tries to allow one to do. Now, you have rolled walk through the arcades in Birmingham, I would think, most of you have. And you know perfectly well you're not sitting there going, oh, wow, never realized I could be so brilliant. I never realized I could, you know, call it 50 million shades of, well, let's say a color. You know, I mean, but now maybe you might think that. Now maybe you might actually think when you walk through on your little routine, your little repetitive routine, you might start seeing colors. As soon as you start seeing the colors, you start doing alchemy. As soon as you start doing alchemy, you start doing imagination. As soon as you start doing imagination, you step into that whole problem of, you know, oh the ecstasy, oh the agony. And that's what this is about. That's, I think that hopefully gives you a sense of what it is to be this urban. You can be in the countryside and be urban, by the way. You don't have to be. Any other questions? I was kind of curious because I think last Kathy, night when we came in to deliver the edible garden, we kind of had the opposite of the arcades. We had the high vis kind of really visceral. You had the, sorry? We had the high vis delivering underneath the guts of the building. And I kind of think this is the part of the arcades that becomes fascinating, that idea of the other space, mm -hmm. or the space behind the fish, or behind the crops, behind everything. And you kind of think you get a very, very different way of seeing it. Are you in theater at all? No, 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 no. Is no, anybody no. here in theater? Anybody do theater around here? Okay, okay. Note to group. Yeah, you know, it's not about a bad idea to think about theater. If you ever go to a theater or a stage of any kind and you just see the production, you think, wow, that's very cool. But then when you actually think, who made that set? How'd they get it on? How did they, what are the outfits? I mean, actually, I have a friend who is a, um, she dyes clothes for the uh, operas, opera houses. And so, you know, when they have these huge uh, events with the, um, you know, hundreds of people in these different operas, she finds the right gray. So all the technical little bitty things that, that come together to make something become what you see. It's recognizing that in the arcades. The arcades, when they're transparent, and this is what the thing was in the, in the 20s and 30s, well, the 30s, that they were meant to be glass. So it wasn't meant to be closed in or anything. It was meant to be this kind of transparent way of moving through things. So you could get a sense of the raw and of the unfinished, of the unsown hem that kind of thing, you get a sense of that. But you're right, I mean, this is what people need to also remember. It's not just, you know, open versus closed. It's open and closed, and also all the rest of it in between. And learning that, learning the kind of, the, not, not so much steps, but the fact that it's dimensionally more powerful and more, there's more than one dimension, more than three dimensions or whatever, is important because it helps one to think in a wider sense. And I'm not saying just, I'm not trying to say ignore the political, ignore the fact that there are people slaving away to make <laughs> make the, the doors open so that you can work at night. And, but it's all part of that picture. I don't know, does that get to what you're? It does, because it kind of struck me that you got this view that you probably get to experience twice in your life that was a very, very strange thing, almost circling all the way underneath the entire structure of the ball ring to go from one point to another. And there was something very, very poignant and that you thought this is something that you don't get to see again. So it's kind of fascinating in that sense of transparency. And also the sense of what a tunnel is. What's the difference yeah. between a tunnel and, uh, and, a, and an arcade or a passageway? What's the difference between a passageway that allows something to go from here to there in a sort of general sense and, and what you're describing, which is this very different kind of moving between things and delivering and, and, and picking up. I, I was at a, a university, University of Greenwich, um, at the Naval College. I don't know if people have been to the Naval College in Greenwich. It's a whole series of underground tunnels that when um, when there was, you know, there were uh, the military <coughs> there, and also if there's ever the royalty there or whomever, and there's some sort of problem, you can go from point A to B completely underground. 
Now, that's true also in the U.S. I mean, there, there are huge, I, mean, I think it's probably true everywhere. There's this, you know, if there was a bomb threat, you can be certain that there's a bunch of people that would be brought to a tunnel and would be hidden underground until the problems come up. This is not an arcade. This is a very different animal. And so the question becomes, how does one negotiate or navigate, rather, that level of, of reality alongside these arcades? It's a complicated thing. I mean, the, the, uh, I'll leave you with maybe one other antidote, which, uh, antidote, which is that um, a couple of years ago, I was giving a talk in Berlin. It was really a uh, very uh, interesting and exciting moment and so on, but I was very exhausted. And I was kind of like a lemming, and when I went to the airport, I just got on the, the, you know, the bus that takes you to the plane, and I got on the plane, and as we were flying back, uh, this little tiny plane, like a three-seater type of thing. The pilot said, okay, now everybody uh, fasten your seat belts because we're now going to land in Prague. I was like, Prague? I thought we were landing in London. So I call over the stewardess and I said, you know, I thought we were landing in London. She says, how could you possibly think we were landing in London? You're on a plane to Prague. <laughs> you know, how did you get on a plane to Prague? I said, well, you know, I was just tired. I just got on the bus and, you know, I got on the plane and, uh, and, and I was arrested and uh, as an international, you know, problem and uh, taken to an underground cell in Prague. And the underground cell, when they finally released me, turned out to be underneath a shopping mall. And I was completely, it, like, it was like so surrealistic to come out of my bondage into a shopping mall, you know. Um, meanwhile, I was like erasing everything on my phone, thinking, okay, I what was happening, it was all very strange. But when you think about it, there's a lot of tunnels around, and there's a lot of, there's a, whole other scenario that goes on and at the same time we must claim the arcades we must fight for that that's why again I go back to the selfish thing that I think it's very brave I think it's very smart that there's an attempt to say how does that work publicly not not in order to to smooth over the kind of horrors of the tunnels but to say we're not just going to accept the tunnels that we also have these things called the arcade. So I think that that came to me. That's it? <laughs> I will miss you. Oh. Um, it was interesting, Mary Shelley's quote uh, sort of preempted uh, Nietzsche. Um, but I was wondering, as a proto feminist, whether uh, making a male monster was a successful kind of becoming. Okay, there's a lot of things in that question. <laughs> Is that a question? No, but there's a lot of things in what you're saying there. Uh, first of all, not only was this, this monster male, this monster was white, this monster was working class, you can have a lot of ways of characterizing that entity, um, which all of which are problematic. You can, you can make an argument. My thinking is, though maybe I'm wrong, I don't know if she was trying to put out this thing called what would a man look like. It was really this thing of if one thinks about a different type of human, what would that human look like? And in that moment, people, you know, even today, people insist on using the word man or he or whatever to cover all sins, you know. And in fact, I'm in these situations where often, because I'm a director, they say to me, you know, well, you know, well, I don't want to call you a chairperson or chairwoman or something, I want to call you, you know, chairman. I said, well, I don't have a problem with that. I do not have a problem with being female. I have a problem with the rest of the world's version of my being female. That's my problem. But my second problem is that you want to call me chairman? Fantastic. You will also call me sir. And if I ever get, you know, advanced, I want to be knighted. I don't want a dame show, sure. you know? Okay, I can play the game. It's fine. And I think that it depends on when and where one's intervening in these, you know, in these debates. Plato, Socrates, even Kant, for example, Kant was a racist. I mean, you know, seriously, you know, Plato, misogynist. Aristotle, he actually thought that people, that women's skulls were smaller than men's skulls, and on that basis, made this entire analysis about how idiotic women are. Okay, he didn't have to even do that because they just, the misogyny of the time, and of the time now, still says that kind of thing. So one has to be very careful 
I'm not saying to excuse it. I'm not saying that, you know, if we were today running Frankenstein, maybe we'd come up with a much better model. Hey, let's do it. Let's come up with a much better model. At the moment, they call it the Cynthia, okay, which is a single cell amoebic bot, okay, which is, I was annoyed that they called the thing Cynthia. It annoyed me because now the scary thing was this female thing. Great. Now we're back to being scared, okay, you know, to, about the, the voracious female, you know, taking over the world. No problem. So it's, it's a difficult game. It's a delicate game. And it's something that one has to be aware of, how to deal with that, how to, you know, what would be your image? How would you deal with the, you know, making of life? What would it look like? It's a tough one. Any other questions? Yeah. Mark. Yeah. Uh, your story of the dyes, the dyes. Oddly, on the train in today. The story of the dyes. Your friend, uh, the dyer. Oh, the yeah, the dyer. Yeah. On the train in today, there was um, people overheard a conversation. People talking about a dyer at a college. They were teachers talking about a dyer in a college, and he was an old guy, and he could, like the alchemy, a pinch of this, a pinch of that, and he was as good as the spectrogram that replaced him. And I was just thinking that. Um, a lot of this seems like on the surface stylistics and that something to be really have a depth would have to be somehow written on the body and quite a lot of that, like our old dyer, seems to be, I mean, good or bad, disappearing and it just becomes uh, stylistics of the mind and, and not a, not, I'm not making a moral judgment, I'm just trying to make an observation that something maybe uh, gained and lost and maybe there's something called anti-alignment or something so there's something else going on within this absolutely I mean, I um, the endarkenment a lot of people call it yeah um, absolutely no I think that it's very important I'm glad you raised that and I'm glad you raised it the way you did I think that one has to learn how to live and how to have knowledge through the body one has to be led by your senses Not, and okay Putting logics together, that's a sense, it's sensible. But there's more than one type of logic. There's many types of logics, and one of the most important types is the ones that come out of the senses. And that does tend to get lost, not just in technology, but it gets lost in all the different civilizations that happen. There are some civilizations that do better at, at highlighting senses and some that do worse. But you're right, it's something that one needs to hang on to because it, it gives a certain kind of rudder a certain kind of navigational tool that the logic just can't do. I mean, uh, another Americanism, uh, there's a writer that I'm sure you've all heard of named Mark, Tw Mark Twain, and he used to always say, you know, don't let uh, your education get in the way of your learning. And it's the same thing, and you know, don't go, if you're gonna really learn something, start with the body, start being, being led by your senses. It will take you in, where, in, in the paths that will help. Um, I'd really like to welcome you all to the, the Jay Griffiths talk, which is happening at 6.15. Um, Jay will be talking about her new book, A Love Letter from a Stray Moon, and she's a wonderful speaker, and I highly recommend um, that you join us for that. Okay, but thank you, Johnny. Thank you very much. Thanks.